G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. Today, we're bringing you another guest from our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series, Sally McManus, the Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, in conversation with Jim Stanford, economist and director at the Australia Institute's Centre for Future Work. More heartbreak outside Centrelink offices as thousands of jobless Australians. Ah, the number one game in town is growing jobs, saving jobs, preserving jobs and creating jobs of the future. If the federal government's proposal for talks between unions and business delivers a second accord style deal. It's not an accord, it's a new process. Can you guarantee though that no worker will be worse off? Well this is a process that will just flow through uh, Sabra. Um, we're getting people together. But it is quite hard to believe that the government spent seven years attacking unions and organised labour want to genuinely negotiate. But, you know, you know let's see what let's see what their, their agenda is. Unions to attack wages and conditions for working people who are, after all, uh, seeing us through this crisis. I'm though to talk to Christian Porter to take us there. Here's the union leader he describes as his new BFF, Sally McManus. On Workers haven't been getting their fair share of productivity or, or profits and so we want to see a, like a better system. An overhaul of skills training and the current TAFE model that he says is... We need to stop the cuts, this government's cut, about $3 billion from TAFE and training. Country and a big drop in apprenticeship figures as well. But we hope that there's more funding that's going to go into that sector as part of the stimulus. Can Australia build or at least renovate its way back to economic prosperity? Well, we're expecting between 25 and 30,000 um, new builds or significant renovations in that battle for jobs and our government is in that battle for jobs. This was recorded live on Thursday 4th of June 2020 and things may have changed since recording. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living and where the Australia Institute is based. We're here in Canberra which is Ngunnawal country and I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. And as we watch police violence erupt across the USA in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, I just wanted to say uh, that we acknowledge that movement and stand in solidarity with it and that it's time also for us here in Australia to reflect on our own systemic racism which has seen more than 430 Aboriginal deaths in custody since the Royal Commission report in 1991 with no criminal convictions for any death and where Aboriginal people are over-incarcerated and over-policed and to recommit ourselves, particularly as white Australians, to educate ourselves and to stand in solidarity with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people right across the country. So the pandemic has obviously exposed uh, a lot of huge and existing problems within our labour market, including the rise of precarious and insecure work. And it's also seen the Morrison government drop a lot of its anti-union agenda to instead work with the union movement. And this week we saw some of those initial meetings between business, the unions and the government as everyone does their best to chart a course out of this recession. So today we are absolutely delighted to have Sally McManus, the Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, in conversation with Jim Stanford, the Director and Economist of the Australia Institute's Centre for Future Work, to talk about how to protect workers as the economy reopens. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jim won the 2018 Galbraith Prize in Economics and is also the author of Economics for Everyone, a short guide to the economics of capitalism, which has been published in six languages. And I'll ask Jim to introduce Sally McManus now. Thanks, Jim. Excellent, uh, Ebony. Thank you very much for hosting this. You're our own left-wing Oprah Winfrey. How wonderfully- <laughs> I wish. <laughs> you, how wonderfully you do these, uh, these webinars. It's been a great, a great series. And I honestly, I think uh, I'm the most excited about uh, uh, this one today. Um, so uh, it's a tremendous honor for me. First of all, I'd like to note that I'm speaking today. Uh, I'm actually in Vancouver, Canada, on the wrong side of the Pacific, uh, from the unceded ter territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Coast Salish peoples, and uh, offer my same respect uh, to them. Uh, what a treat for us to be joined by uh, Sally McManus. Uh, Sally and I go way back, actually, long before we even formed the Center for Future Work. 
Um, I've always admired her a very forthright, determined, uh, straight up approach uh, to working for social change. Um, and uh, uh, I never make it a practice to read the bios of speakers word for word because they're usually long and pompous and boring. But I'm going to make an exception with Sally's bio uh, that her office sent me because it's this one is perfect. It's so perfect. Here's Sally's full bio. This is the whole thing. Sally commenced her working life as a Pizza Hut driver, cleaner, and a shop assistant prior to joining the ACTU's Trainee Organizers Program in 1994. Uh, from this, she went on to become an organizer, then branch secretary of the ASU uh, in New South Wales. Uh, by the way, uh, Sally and everyone, the ASU is the union to which uh, the Center for Future Work uh, employees belong, and I'm proud to say we have 100% density uh, in our shop. Uh, then in 2017, Sally was elected as ACTU secretary, the first woman to hold that position in the ACTU's 90 year history. And that's it, that's the whole bio. So uh, I just think that totally reflects uh, Sally's uh, modest, uh, straight up, uh, no bullshit personality. Uh, she possesses <laughs> that rarest, rarest of attributes, attributes in, in public discourse, which is uh, absolute, utter, straight up uh, sincerity with everything uh, that she says. Uh, since I, I was uh, at the center when she took the role of secretary in 2017, she's been an outstanding leader uh, of the union movement. Uh, I would say both visionary and pragmatic. Uh, we had that whole determined fight around the change the rules campaign that I thought was uh, extremely well executed. Of course, it didn't get the outcome that we wanted. Uh, has really, I think, built the power and relevance uh, of the of the union movement, including in this uh, current moment, in the middle of this uh, pandemic. So uh, with everything that's happening uh, in the world uh, to defend workers, both from infection and from destitution, uh, the working class in Australia couldn't have a better ally than uh, Sally. So we're so honored you could join us, Sally. Welcome to our webinar. Hey, thanks so much, and Ebony, for the intro too. It's really great to be here. I mean, at an undisclosed location, as you can see. Yes, I see you've got your finger on the button there that you can always threaten to push if the conversation with Christian Porter doesn't go <laughs> the way you want it to. This is a Rebel Alliance headquarters I'm at. Rebel Alliance, indeed. Uh, well, Sally, let me, uh, let me start uh, with a, a just kind of very broad uh, question. I mean, this is just an incredible moment. We understand that we are living history right now uh, in all kinds of ways. And uh, before we get into some of the details, I wonder if you could just kind of reflect broadly on uh, what you see the threats for working people in this current moment and what you see as some of the opportunities? Well, I think you can't um, start without, um, you know, the number one thing still is, is the public health uh, crisis and the threat to life um, where there's it continues to be the virus. That's still got to be our number one issue because we see the devastation in countries where they haven't been able to suppress it. Um, the cost to life um, and the cost to a lot of working people who uh, contract the virus then, especially those in, in the healthcare uh, area. And it's been pretty devastating for a lot of hospital workers all around the world. And, um, you know, every day I wake up and just um, grateful that, um, that we have all worked together to not have that situation in Australia. So that's first of all. And, it'd be a mistake to take our eye off that ball because um, uh, if we allowed workplaces to open without proper health and safety measures in place and without supporting workers to be able to take time off if they are sick or they think they might be sick to get tested, we're going to risk a second wave. And so obviously the most important thing is, is that that, that, could, that could cost lives. But secondly, we've all been through now across our country some forms of lockdown and to have industries close again after what what has happened would be devastating for working people and obviously for for the country as well so those are the immediate that has to be the immediate priority now assuming that we continue to suppress the virus in australia the biggest um, challenge we're going to face i think will be a um, struggle over what is the best way to rebuild afterwards? And I remember at the beginning of the pandemic watching this big um, ideological worldwide one struggle happening around what was more important, public health or the economy. And unfortunately, we see, you know, the, the likes of Boris Johnson and, um, and Donald Trump, um, you know, Becero, like all those people 
take the right wing populists of the world take a view that um, they were not going to listen to experts and the economy comes first and what the billionaires want is what should happen. And we see how devastating that is. And luckily, we did have that big, um, that big, that big, you know, fight behind the scenes and publicly happening in our country too. And luckily, in the end, it prevailed. The public health was more important. I think when we now um, hopefully look to the other side of it, we're going to see the same type of ideological struggle around the world. Um, so here we will see it and it will be about is austerity um, the way uh, out of this or is um, government-led um, stimulus and plans for jobs and um, uh, deliberate um, thought-out um, interventions that are, that are led by the government, is that the way out of this um, crisis? And that that's going to I think hit us first in terms of the um, the what the response. There will be a budget, obviously, in October in in, in Australia, and um, the big um, threat we have is that our government will um, look to austerity, and that's the way that they'll try and pursue it. And that's our next big fight. I mean, of of the many uh, absolutely incredible things that we've seen in the last uh, two or three months. I mean, one of the most incredible was seeing Scott Morrison stand up and announce a $130 billion new program uh, to support wages and help workers stay attached to their jobs. I, I never dreamed in a million years that would happen, and that was a huge victory, and obviously the ACTU was, was part of that. On the other hand, there's obviously lots of problems in how it was rolled out, and it turned out he kept $60 billion of that money in his back pocket, um, and then the risk that it could all be basically cut off too soon. Um, how are we going to respond to that sort of knee-jerk tendency to get back to a, a sort of austerity mind frame? Well, I think first of all, we should acknowledge um, the, the wage subsidy um, fight that happened and the fact that JobKeeper is there in the first place is because of um, the trade union movement of this country. Um, with the help of your of Australia Institute and you, Jim, um, uh, early on in terms of the research, but for quite a while we were the only voice pushing this and the need for it because we could see um, why we needed it, um, the big effect it was going to have on on people's jobs if if we didn't have a form of wage subsidy. And so for, for several weeks and several weeks in the middle of a pandemic is like maybe two years. So um, it was just our voice. And then that was joined by others. And slowly um, we won over, obviously, the Labor Party um, and other political parties. But um, we slowly won over the employers. The employers, um, getting them on side was the thing that tipped it, uh, uh, on, along with um, just how devastating uh, the, the, the scenes outside Centrelink were. So we need to remember that it was because we were the movement that was prepared to stand up and had the firepower to just keep going um, and knowing how to campaign in that circumstance um, having said that, the, the program itself and the design itself, which, of course, the government um, uh, did, uh, has had a lot of flaws. We all know um, it's not universal, and that's a sort of fundamental problem with it. Really, um, you know, we were proposing a wage subsidy for everyone of, of, of 80%, um, but the thing is, is once the government decided not to make it universal and by that, I guess I mean anyone who's lost their jobs or hour, hours because of the coronavirus been able to access it, um, it meant that people inevitably were going to miss out. The fact they couldn't um, find a definition to cover all the forms of insecure work in our country, like, you know, says everything about how, how bad insecure work has got. Um, and the fact that whole industries have missed out because of the nature of their industries and really ridiculous things in a way like um, workers like the ones at the airport that are, are on very low wages and conditions that work for Tol Donata, who's owned by um, a foreign uh, um, government, they're missing out. It's not their fault who their employer is. They're all in the same boat. So we've got all the working people in our country who have lost their jobs, some getting supported and some not. And, of course, um, all the visa workers too that don't even get job seeker. So... Um, you know, and that's been devastating to watch in terms of people just running out of money and how desperate they are. So uh, addressing the universality of it, um, it is pretty important. But now we're running up onto another problem, which, of course, is 
it's meant to expire on the 28th of September and that a whole lot of jobs are being maintained at the moment because of JobKeeper, um, even with its faults. And so extending it and making it universal need to be, you know, two of our, our, um, our claims. And now, now we know there's an extra $60 billion sitting there. I think we can probably make the argument that we can afford it. Um, there's all the discussion, of course, turning to reopening the economy and what's going to be required to reconstruct it, really. It's not going to just snap back, obviously. Uh, the government came out with, with one proposal today for this uh, subsidy for home renovations that will be very, uh, very targeted at a very small group of people with a lot of money to spend. You have to spend... Uh, uh, $150,000 on your reno in order to get 25 back from the government. That's just an incredibly silly and, and unfair and ineffective way to, to, to try and pitch recovery. Um, Sally, the ACTU has had a, a, an eight-point vision uh, with, I think, a very different idea of how to rebuild the economy. Would you like to talk about that, both uh, what's in it and how to make it uh, resonate in the moment today? Well, um <laughs> Briefly, that, that's all about um, going back to what I said before about the government needing to take the lead to get us out of where we are. And it is drawn on also the lessons of the past. And so in our own country um, during the Great Depression, uh, the government of the Times Labor government actually um, cut wages. And that was sort of the orthodoxy, like um, people thinking that that's what you had to do to cope and that just meant that the that depression was was deeper and longer and harder um, for working people. And then in more recent history, of course, we had the GFC, where our government at the time took a very different approach to it, and where they had um, targeted support for industries that then had a knock-on effects to a whole lot of other jobs, which meant that we um, we didn't suffer in the same way other people did. And that's a contrast to you know, the big experiments about austerity, once again, say, in the UK, and what result did they have? The same one um, that we had in the Great Depression, you know, it, the, the effect for working people in the UK because of austerity has been devastating. And, of course, you know, you cut back on all the public, se- all the public sector, which is um, one place where they, where they always attack, and then all of a sudden you're relying on their NHS in the middle of a pandemic that's been run down and defunded over a long period of time. So, I mean, the public sector is, is, a key, is going to be a key part of um, supporting communities, not just in terms of service provision, but in terms of um, having uh, good, well-paid jobs, especially in regional um, Australia, where, you know, public sector employment will mean that you've got um, people in those communities that are earning um, um, uh, fair wages and where does that money go in those regional communities? Well, you, not only do you have the service, which is the, the, the benefit and the support for the people there, but um, that money gets circulated directly, obviously, back into that community. Like the people are working and living um, in a regional area and you've got a public sector job um, and hopefully most of those public sector jobs are, um, have more permanency. Well, there's confidence to spend and people um, will spend. And then, of course, there's um, the need for us to look at, you know, what projects, nation-building projects do um, we need as a country um, uh, in order to uh, improve our infrastructure for all the reasons why we'll be able to increase our productivity as well. Um, That will also lead to um, jobs being created and the knock-on effects of that. So, um, if you look at that announcement that you that you touched on around um, housing, and so it's almost like sometimes you think the the coalition just target things to who they believe their constituency is, rather than thinking about what's the best for the country. So what they could have done is decided to invest in social housing, which there's such a big need for it, number one. Um, We've also got big problems in terms of housing prices full stop in the past and the the stock of public housing. Um, Being able to put money into that, the the benefits of both being able to build something that's going to um, have a big benefit for people, but also the um, amount of jobs it will create in the construction industry and all the knock-on effects down the... um, down the line, uh, you know, would have been much better um, bang for buck in terms of, you know, um, uh, the way to go. So 
Uh, part of our eight-point plan, of course, too, is, is issues to do with um, halving the number of insecure jobs we've got in our country. So uh, I know that ACTU has been going on and on and on about it. So I hope everyone on here is bored by me saying it. Like when you were bored, that I know that I've that we've got there. But, um, you know, we've got one of the highest rates in the OECD. There's around 40% of Australian workers that don't even get um, the basics like paid sick leave and or annual leave. And you look at the other countries and successful economies uh, in the world, they don't have the number of insecure jobs we do. So why shouldn't we aim to halve it? Why shouldn't we say as a country, well, um, we are going to set this as our target and we're going to go about doing that. And you think about the effect of that now. Like if people had um, jobs where they knew that they had more certainty about them uh, and that the employer just couldn't let them go for no reason, that's going to be important in terms of people's confidence to be able to spend as well. So the knock-on effects of secure jobs, of course it has a big effect for a family and a community, but it's got, I think, a very positive effect for the whole country. I, I know we've all been fighting this insecure work issue for so long, but I think the pandemic created just a whole new opportunity for us to argue why, the, why it's wrong. Not just yeah. that it's unfair and economically destructive, but it's a danger to public health to have people working multiple jobs and not having sick pay. So that's a whole new dimension. And in a way, too, uh, I think in our country, because there has been economic growth, even though um, it hasn't affected everyone equally and, and the, the world wasn't fantastic for everyone before the pandemic, people in insecure jobs, it, it got very normalised. And even though um, they were insecure and even though they they came with all of the, uh, you know, weaknesses and lack of benefits, people probably thought, well, okay, I'm still coping. And then what's happened is the pandemic, you know, the f- first jobs to all go were, of course, all the casual jobs, like just gone because the employer, you know, could. Um, if you're in a permanent job, they had to add it up. They had to think, well, I will have to pay out redundancy pay. So that puts a break on employers making rash, scared, stupid or rational um, decisions. They have to stop and say, well, hang on, um, is it worth me doing this? Because it costs a little bit in order to let a permanent job go. So you've got to make a much more considered decision. Whereas um, in this case, what happened is like nearly one in three workers, you know, lost their jobs and um, quickly. And so I think it's been a really, really harsh experience for a lot of um, people in Australia that have been in insecure work. And having now been through this, it's a huge wake up call for the country and that we should never go back to what we had before. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Sally, the whole country has been fascinated by the change in tone of the relationship between the union movement and the government, which is obviously a, a, a very positive development. And also fascinated by the fact that you and Christian Porter have become BFFs through the I course of the, the crisis. His definition. <laughs> he said that, yeah. Uh, can you talk a bit about, you know, without giving away any secrets, of course, we all, we, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in those meetings that you had yesterday. Uh, talk about the process with the government, these discussions you're entering. Uh, why has the government changed its tone? And what are the risks and opportunities for you in going into that room? Well, uh, When the pandemic um, hit, all of a sudden, the whole country was dependent on um, so-called essential workers. And um, those essential workers, a whole lot of them are unionised, strongly unionised. So the whole healthcare sector, um, teachers, uh, you know, even your supermarkets. And so um, whilst people, um, some commentators would say, oh, what's the relevance of the union movement? Well, all of a sudden they were reliant on union members. Um, You know, you think about ports, the construction industry that kept going, um, the mining industry that kept going. So um, all of a sudden we were in a different position because of that. So, you know, we need to recognise that that's partly um, what what happened there. Then, of course, we had to respond, and when I say we, the union movement, in terms of, um, you know, what we got, we're going to do about the fact that, um, you know, employers were needing to be able to um, reduce hours because there just wasn't the work there. And we didn't want jobs to be lost either. So um, there was a period of time where there was a lot of common interest, um, you know, which rarely happens, Um for a period of time about just focused on saving lives and saving jobs. And so 
I think that our industrial relations system, as much as you will hear commentators saying it's inflexible, have we got any more proof than what has happened in the last um, eight weeks that we will never be under as much pressure, our industrial relations set of laws, than it has been in the last eight weeks? Never, ever will it be under that much pressure. And what did it do? It responded quickly, flexibly, and with protections for workers, like while protecting workers as well. And you compare that to other places in the world where, like the United States, where there aren't those protections, there's no checks and balances, there's, there's none of that. Um, like, because what we are able to do is to make changes for just a set period of time to deal with a unique set of circumstances and then go back to all the protections we had before. So um, it really flies in the face of, of you, know, you know, what some of the commentators are saying. So... In terms of the relationship with the government, I think that some of the things that have happened is that um, ever since work choices, uh, the the general view of the, uh, well, even before then, but in particular since then, was to demonise and delegitimise the union movement. And it was like a full-time job for um, some people in um, the coalition. And that's what they saw they were there to do. And every day it was like, you know, let's put out a press release attacking, you know, the, the union movement of their, their country. And um, the, for them to step away from that is not a small thing. And we shouldn't underestimate that just in terms of history like that's a a big thing for them to do to drop the ensuring integrity um bill uh that was all about you know destroying us um a big thing for them to step away from that as well too and i think it's because um they realize that uh in order uh to get through this that cooperation is you know, at least giving that a go, like seeing if it is possible, I think that that's what's in their head. I think the other thing is, is that after they've worked with us, they've realised that probably a lot of things in their heads or have been told to them or their own folklore isn't right. Like this idea, like at the height of the pandemic, that I think there was fear from the government because it was a unionised workers that somehow like we'd all go on strike to push for pay rises or to somehow you know, disrupt this, the things. And they didn't realise that they're not our principles. Like we knew um, what we were facing. The nurses knew what they were facing. People did everything they could to get, you know, more nurses operating. People have done everything they can to get the PPE. Like we were pulling together because, you know, we care about people first and that, I think they saw that up front and that um, any view that we're somehow opportunistic, selfish people had to evaporate because that's not who we are. Um, And so I think probably some of their own, you know, folklore or narrative about us sort of collapsed a bit. Um, Not to say that they, you know, some people uh, within the coalition or outside might try and, you know, redraw those cartoons like when they want to, but it's sort of they couldn't um, deal with that. The final thing I want to say is that it's conservative governments around the world. It's not part of what most of them do, um, just this sort of, you know, obsession with attacking their trade union movement. Like they may not agree with them and they constantly would come up with policies and uh, that, that, that unions would disagree with. But what's been happening in Australia has been at another level for for a long time now. So it shouldn't be it shouldn't be such a um, big thing for uh, a government of the day, no matter who they are, to say, well, here's a crisis affecting working people. We're going to talk to working people and their representatives. And I just hope that's a normal thing um, into the future. Um, having said that, we've got no illusions. Um, there is a whole history there. Um, we're going into this process just to do everything we can to continue to advocate um, for um, stronger and better workers' rights. I have heard from several unions that their membership has grown during the last few months of the pandemic. So that's an interesting sign about what you say about social legitimacy and relevance. Do you think that can be sustained? Um, nearly every union, this is the case, with some exceptions and the exceptions you you can imagine. I mean, the flight attendants union... Um, you know, all their members are pretty much stood down and that, you know, they've got a very uncertain future. Um, uh, some other un- very unions that are in that situation, like the MEAA, although they've also had um, people um, join too, but nearly every other union's seen a qu- quite big surge in membership. And I think it was um, 
not just about the legitimacy. I think it was that point where a whole lot of people who aren't union members have sort of always benefited from the fact that other people were union members and the fact the union movement was there. But they all of a sudden thought, oh, my God, um, I might actually need to be a member of a union because of the crisis. Like, well, I'm going to lose my job. What are my rights? What am I going to do? How do I keep safe at work? And it was no longer... Uh, something that I think a whole lot of people could just sit back and and think that everyone else, you know, would protect them. Like there was, um, like, that's part of the reason I think, I think a whole lot of people who thought, oh, well, you know, I support unions, but I haven't joined. uh, It was a bit of a tipping point for them. Uh, Sally, let me ask you one more, uh, I think, important question before we go to the audience for Q&A. Um, we're all uh, absolutely distressed at what we're seeing unfold in America with the, the violence and the racism and, uh, and what that means and what it could mean down the road. Um, unions, of course, around the world have tried to unify workers, not divide them. Um, how do you as a union leader see this moment and the importance of a multiracial workers movement? Well, um, this obviously comes from a whole history of, you know, deep racism in a country just like it is in Australia. Uh, that's, you know, as Ebony was talking about in the beginning, the, you know, um, disproportionate, um, well, how many Indigenous people in our country are incarcerated, life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera, day-to-day life in terms of um, what to expect with the police. It's not something that we just look at the US and go, oh, isn't that terrible? Thank God that's not happening in Australia. That does happen in Australia. Um, I think the thing I wanted to say that's um, in addition to that is the other things happening in the United States, there's been that obviously um, constant issue in terms of racism. There was a shocking, um, you know, um, video footage of of the murder. Um, But the other thing that's happening is the pandemic is having a disproportionate effect on people of colour, um, black Americans. So Afro-Americans have are, are, are got a much higher um, um, death rate um, for all the reasons that we know, like not being able to be in isolation in, you know, a nice big house and, you know, the types of living that the poorer people have. And not only that, they've been the ones that have been expected to work at this time as well. And also unemployment in the US. So many people, because they don't have the protections we have, and there's no job keeper in the United States that, you know, who has been worst affected by that? So it's like extra layers on top of it. Um, And so I sort of look with horror, like, you know, on one hand, like the bravery of people protesting, but then again, they're also doing it in the middle of a pandemic and that you watch that happen and you think, well, is this society and the fact it's been stoked by their their president, is this, is it falling apart? Like, has it reached its conclusion in terms of um, the level of unfairness and inequality that basically the pandemic has not just laid bare, but just sort of come down, come down with like a, like a boot on top of people. And that is it that people have just said, well, what have we got to lose? Is that really what's happening? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a very dangerous moment. I think even in countries like Canada or Australia, where we don't have quite as, as terrible a a situation, we, we still have a responsibility to recognize we have to keep the movement unified in a multiracial movement where people of all color can see themselves as part of it otherwise we'll end up going down the same pike so yeah absolutely Anyways, our movement uh, our workers movement does exactly how you um exactly how you described it every single person should be able to see themselves as part of it you know that there's a part there's a place for me here it's not just welcoming like it's other people welcoming you it's it is you and that's that's what we've all yeah, got to, right. to be Okay, I'm going to sneak in one more question before we go to the Q&A. I know Ebony is uh, breathing down my neck, but this is a quick one. The 1,400 people on this webinar might not know, Sally is an avid bird watcher. And if you follow her Twitter account, you see the weirdest birds. So, Sally, what is the weirdest bird you've ever seen? Um, there's this bird in Guyana, so um, right in the – it's also in Peru, but this one's in Guyana. It's called um, – I encourage people to – Google it, um, cock of the rock. That's what it's called. And I reckon it looks exactly like Donald Trump. So please Google it and see if you agree. 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. Your life, Ebony. But it just reminded me of him. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, and I think a, a good spot to jump off into audience questions. I'll definitely be Googling that uh, when, when I finish. Um, as Jim said, we do have more than 1,300 people on, uh, on this webinar. So thank you all for joining us. And I can see people have joined us from right across the country and even a couple of international people from Malaysia and joining us from some other countries as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, the first question I've got here is from Monica Rose. She asks, what is the road forward for workers in female dominated industries, which are more likely to be hit hard by the recession and that construction is often used as the path forward, um, but it doesn't really address the disproportionate loss of jobs for women. Thanks, Sally. That's a really good point. Um, quite often you know, when you hear some politicians talk about jobs, actually in their heads it's like blue-collar jobs. That's what they're talking about. And they're, they're not obviously the only jobs. Um, and we know from the statistics that came out yesterday, unfortunately, the people that have been hardest hit are young people and women. And that's partly because of the industries that have been um, hardest hit. So obviously all the ones that have had to shut down because of the public health reasons like hospitality and retail, the feminised industries, but also our, um, our economy and the makeup of our, our economy has changed in Australia very significantly. Women's participation prior to the pandemic in the workforce has never been at such a high level. The other thing is, though, in Australia is we've got this really gender se segregated workforce. So that just basically means that there's a really high percentage of women um, or men in um, different industries. So we haven't done a very good job of breaking that down. And those industries that are feminised, for example, um, early childhood educators is a really good one, um, are undervalued. And they're undervalued because, you know, historically it's been seen as women's work. So if you think about early childhood educators, um, you know, some people or our society has thought, well, women did that, has, do that for free. Like, why should we value this work um, because it's been done for free in the past? And in the past, that was also arguments for nurses too. Well, women went and volunteered to be the carers in various ways, and it certainly was for community workers too that, that care for people, family members. You did it for free. Why should we value it? So um, that's a, a big um, fight and a, a struggle that is going to obviously have to continue um, post-pandemic. But um, thinking about those industries uh, in terms of recovery um, is partly also why I was talking about the public sector um, before as well. So you think about teachers and nurses and all of the other public sector workers um, in education and in service provision. Um, a lot of them are feminised too, but they are going to be, they also need to be like the key thing that government invests in or in order to um, pull us out of, uh, out, of, um, out of the recession we're in. Thanks, Sally. Um, uh, Harsha Parara, if you're on there, we're going to come to you next, um, but I'll take one more question from the typed questions here. This question is from Dick Rowe. He asks, what is the ACTU's position on a shorter working week? Uh, thinking particularly, I think, of the four-day working week uh, proposed by Jacinda Ardern as we move out of the COVID emergency and as a means of expanding workforce opportunities. Well, it's not something that we've um, or you have uh, thought through in terms of it being a universal position. We know that, um, you know, we had a big problem prior to the pandemic with um, what's called underemployment, which is basically people needing more hours and not having enough. Um, and also part of what Jacinta's done is about a temporary measure too, to think about, well, if we're going to keep people in jobs, perhaps this is a way to do it to reduce the hours. There's a lot to think about with that, like a lot to think about, but um, there's a lot to be wary of too, because uh, I can imagine in our country with our political environment, a whole lot of employers um, grabbing that idea and saying, well, yep, that's great. Let's um, reduce everyone's hours and their pay, which of course isn't, um, isn't the idea uh, that we've been pursuing for a long period of time and working people have to reduce working hours with no loss of pay. So 
I think that that's something that we would um, need to think about, but think about in terms of also avoiding um, the dangers of opening up some of those ideas, which in the end might get used against us. Uh, you're on mute, Ebony. Thank you. Uh, Ahasha Parara, can you hear me there? Yes. So, uh, what's your question for the panel? Uh, sorry, I actually posted a question, uh, but my question is to do with uh, the banks going ahead with restructures during the pandemic, which will inevitably uh, result in the loss of jobs. So is there a strategy in place uh, by the union movement to try and pressurize the banks to hold off on that until there's some stability returns to the economy? Well, I do know that a whole lot of... Um not a whole lot, some of the banks who already had uh, ideas about reducing um, uh, jobs prior to the pandemic are, are trying to fast track that, in particular um, the closure of um, retail outlets uh, at various places. And I do know that the FSU and um, Finance Sector Union and ACTU are obviously opposing that. Um, but um, if you're from the industry or even if you're not, you'll know how hard it is to fight against the big banks I think that one of the other things that will be a challenge for every single, well, the one in three workers who've been working for from home, so um, bank workers as well as public sector workers as well as a whole lot of other workers who can work from home during this time, I think that a lot of employers will think, oh, well, this has worked out well for us um, and that we want to keep this going. And so I'm sure some workers will think, oh, this, is, this, this hasn't been too bad if they don't have kids. They, they, they might think that that too. So I think that as a, you know, the, the workers' movement, the union movement in this country has got to get ahead of this. And um, we can't let employers, you know, deal with this as, as a means to um, further cut jobs. However, there may be benefits for working people in terms of working from home too. So... Um, not to announce something on a, on a webinar, but I probably am, that I think that uh, this is one of our sort of key areas that we know that employers are going to want to move to and we're going to want to uh, involve um, working people in a whole um, discussion in terms of building a worker's claim for what do we say about working from home? Like what should be um, our, um, our, our principles uh, that and our expectations from employers we can unite around to, to push for across all um, um, so-called white-collar um, work um, so that we can unite around um, that. Uh, I guess it's been a mass experiment for a whole lot of people too. So um, there'll never be a better time for us all to be involved in a discussion about that than a united um, campaign around it. Ebony, uh, I, have to, I have to jump in there with a promo, a promo for one of our Centre for Future Work reports on working from home, the pros and cons uh, that I wrote with my colleague, Alison Pennington, on our site, uh, futurework.org.au, that goes into detail to some of the risks and the opportunities that Sally just mentioned. So we've got a lot more work to do in that area. There's the end of the advertisement. <laughs> Thanks, most definitely. Uh, Pam Swain, I'm going to come to you next, but first I'll take another question from um, Emma Winnell here. And just before we move on, Working in tracksuit pants is my number one uh, benefit to working from home, but I do miss all my colleagues in the office and we've just started back this week. So that's been very exciting. Um, Emma Winnell is interested to hear uh, the panel's thoughts on the university sector with over 70% of the workforce in casual positions and a lot of people staring down the barrel of job loss with little to no support. Um, either by universities or from the government, what can be done to save jobs in the industry more broadly? First to you, Sally. Well, um, uh, first, first of all, a shout out to any university worker that's on here. I know you guys are going through um, a really, really difficult time. And essentially, I do know too that a whole lot of those vice chancellors, well, some of them are being opportunistic in terms of what they're trying to pursue too and that um, your attempts to um, build a framework uh, around or limitations on what employers um, uh, might be able to get away with and the difficulties around all of that and the, you know, hard fight that's ahead now, which is unfortunately going to be um, university by university, um, really. But the fact that 
I think it's Wollongong University that had the highest rate of casualisation and it was like 75% of the whole workforce. Um, the, these, you know, jobs and that of very people who have invested for so long in their education and those jobs used to be permanent jobs. So it's not like it's such a good example. It's not like they, um, it essentially we've taken what were permanent jobs and we've turned them into casual jobs. And when I say we, obviously I mean the employers and it just needs to be um, an absolute priority uh, in that sector for all the unions that um, there needs to be strict limits on the number of um, uh, casual jobs, fixed term contract jobs, when they're used and how they're used. I know how horrible it's been for all of those people who've been let go um, in that sector but the fact that even they're in that position in the first place um, is not good either. So um, I think that there's going to need to be a united fight around, if possible, like common demand around um, returning that. Obviously, if it's campus by campus, that's going to be hard. Um, the united fight really with the government around the fact that universities have been excluded from JobKeeper, um, which, you know, and that's what JobKeeper is about about dealing with, um, you know, the pandemic and um, downturns that happen because of it and because of, of course, in this case, the closure of um, the, the borders. But I can imagine, too, if unemployment's going to go up, there's going to be a much um, bigger demand, as there should be, on the university sector and on um, people wanting to um, study and go to university. So I think that this is now not just a short-term um, struggle and it's very hard when... Um, your starting point is is that you know casual workers like their rights are, are, are hardly any, um, but also a medium term um, um, plan because you know, that's a whole generation of, of university workers who who've been let go, and so um, um, the people who are in the permanent jobs is an obligation then to to say like never again, like we've got to now insist on permanent jobs. Um, Jim, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, uh, no, that really covered it. The exclusion of universities from JobKeeper is inexplicable. I mean, this is an important export-oriented industry, uh, 20,000 jobs uh, at risk. And I think it was largely driven by ideology, frankly. I think the government thought, you know, somehow by being tough love with universities, they'd force universities to crack down on their own workforce, and they could show the common folk out there that, you know, they weren't pandering to these so-called intellectual elites. It's a horrible decision. And it's going to lead to long-term destru destruction in, in one of Australia's brightest export industries. Thanks, Jim. Um, Pam Swain, are you there? Can you hear me? <clears throat> Look, I am, Ebony. I'm, I'm going to say, what was the question that you, because I've written a lot of questions down, which was the one you particularly wanted me to ask? Uh, there wasn't one in particular. It was only because okay, you had your hand just raised. So wave my hand. Okay, your well, pick. <laughs> All right. I, look, universities, my heart goes out. Creative industries, because that's my industry. That's terrible. Um, I was just going to ask Sally, though, about um, the job market or, or how people get jobs, you know, the, whether they're people who've just come out of uni, whether they've come out of school, uh, whether they're, uh, they've lost their jobs and they're looking for something new. When you've got we well, always had the 457 visa thing going. And there seemed to be a lot of jobs taken up by people coming from overseas, which is fine. It's worked really well in the um, uh, restaurant business, etc. Incredibly important there. Um, will you be able to take on board that part of the working economy as you talk to government? Yeah, so um, that point's an important one because... because Prior to the pandemic, there was about 1.4 million people on, on work visas and um, now there's just not going to be that many for all the obvious reasons. People won't be able to get here. The borders will close for a period of time. So first of all, that gives um, us as a country a chance to uh, discuss, you know, what's the right mix of this because for over a period of time we've moved from um, uh, programs which are about permanent migration to um, to temporary um, uh, 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 skills um, visas and that unfortunately a whole lot of employers because they're an employer-driven system, they, they, they're the ones who drive it. Un unfortunately, a whole lot of those employers have been 
um, ripping off the system and exploiting people and that we've seen that happen over and over and over again. Um, but we, of course, a whole lot of the people that um, were on visas, in particular overseas students, were working in the hospitality um, industry, um, restaurants. Well, if there's not as many people there, well, that then will mean that a whole lot of other um, people who've lost their jobs, there may be opportunities um, in those industries. Having said that, we don't yet know um, how well a whole lot of those industries are going to recover. Um, like, will all the cafes come back just how they were before? Uh, we're going to need social distancing for a period of time too. Does that mean that all of those restaurants are going to have the same number of staff in them? So it's so um, hard to know what's going to happen into the future because the economic um, and, and the jobs outcome is also tied to the health outcome. So sort of going back to my earlier point about the health outcome and, and keeping us safe from a second wave is, is really critically important. Um, I think we've got probably time for two more questions, hopefully. So the first one is from, <clears throat> uh, where is he? Fred Sin. Um, he asked for your thoughts, Sally, on what is the best outcome of the Morrison government's approach to this new round of IR conversations that the union movement can hope for? There's no point having expectations that um, we're going to be able to achieve, you know, everything the union movement wants. This is a conservative government. Um, I think that they, the politics around insecure work has changed for the reasons we talked about before. Um, for ages, we couldn't even get um, employers, let alone the government, to accept that it was a problem. They just kept repeating statistics saying, oh, insecure work hasn't got worse, whereas every single working person knows it's got worse. So I don't think they're, like, when they try and have those old debates, they're just not working now. So I do think that there's um, a, an idea that, um, that something's got to be done. In terms of what something is, um, from the union movement's perspective, this is like a, a multi-level problem. Um, the, the types of insecure work in our country have become multi-level. So you've got um, labour hire, which is sometimes a form of casual employment, but not always, uh, where whole workforces have been just replaced. And so there's that. Um, there's the gig economy, which has been growing, obviously, and those workers having no job security, no rights whatsoever. There's fixed term contracts. So we're one of the very few countries in the OECD that even have this idea of endless fixed term contracts where you can have a contract that goes for a year and it can get renewed every year forever. But then every year you're thinking, well, am I going to have a job next year or aren't I? And that, you know, formally you've only got, you know, a job for a year. That's not, not only is that not normal, it's just like a complete outlier compared to other countries. So that's a problem. And then, of course, we've talked about casual work being a problem as well. So um, in order to address this properly, I think, first of all, there needs to be an acknowledgement um, from both employers and the government that it's we've got too many insecure jobs. Then we can talk about how to fix it. And um, I think that probably at the moment you've seen from the public commentary the only um, aspect of that bigger picture that the government and employers have wanted to talk about is um, a narrow part of the casual employment issues. So um, if there can be a gain for workers there, well, of course, um, the trade union movement will take it. Like if we can move forward and even if it's only a little step, well, we, we'll take the little step. But um, I worry that it won't be nearly enough to, to deal with, with, with the issues. Um, in terms of wage theft, this is another good example of where um, public campaigning by the trade union movement has meant that um, public opinion on this issue has changed. And whenever public opinion changes because of your campaigning, you create territory that governments um, may move into because they can see that the public are on side. So there may be um, an ability to get better laws in terms of stopping wage theft and workers getting their money back and um, um, fines on employers, um, those type of things. But again, in that area, like one of the other issues is, is union officials, union delegates, but union officials not having access to um, uh, workplaces like we used to 
uh, to be able to stop wage theft. Like I can't imagine that the government's going to change that. Not that we would, um, we're going to argue for all of these things. And the same in bargaining, you can see all this discussions about something called the boot test, which I bet most people don't even understand. But the main problem with enterprise bargaining is it's enterprise only bargaining. Like the problem we've got is that so many workers in Australia are totally excluded from collective bargaining because they're in small workplaces or that they're um, in areas where they've got no bargaining power if there's just a small um, set of people or the real decision makers are at the top of a supply chain or there are funding bodies. So these are a lot of the feminised areas we're talking about too. So we're going to go and argue the, the bigger picture about what we think needs to happen, um, but whether or not the government, let alone the employers, um, agree with us, you, you can see that that's going to be a bit of an uphill battle. Um, thanks, Sally. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I think we can squeeze in one last question. Um, Andrew Fraser has talked here about the Ross Gittins column this week on the New South Wales government kind of putting up a trade-off between investing in uh, public works and infrastructure um, compared to uh, public sector wage increases and uh, that Gittins was talking about that, you know, more or less we can have our cake and eat it too, but the New South Wales government is saying that the budget can't sustain both goals. Um, what's your response to that? And then I'll come to you, Jim, finally. Um, I agree with Ross Gittins, but I reckon that Jim can probably give a more thorough answer because I feel like <laughs> I've sucked up all your, your, your oxygen, Jim, <laughs> especially given that you're in a different time zone. Mm. Well, Sally, you did a remarkable job on the uh, fundamental economic relationships earlier when you were describing the eight-point plan. I thought that was marvelous. So I, in fact, I thought if that gig as the ACTU secretary ever loses its appeal, you could actually become an economist, an oh, economic good, researcher. Good, why? That's never going to happen, Jim. That's <laughs> all that to you, mate. Right on. Uh, well, I, and we've been arguing uh, at the centre, and of course, our colleagues in the Australian Institute had a great uh, report out this week as well, showing that that was a false choice. First of all, you don't have to have one or the other. In a time of crisis, you need both. And moreover, the amount of jobs created by the infrastructure spending was less than the number of jobs created by keeping the pay uh, going into normal pay rises. The biggest risk of this knee-jerk uh, desire for wage austerity and pay freezes, um, this is work that I've done in the past with uh, Troy Henderson, on is how the um, pay freeze gets mimicked by employers throughout the labor market. We saw this with the first pay cap in New South Wales in 2011, which was supposed to be a temporary measure, and it's still there nine years later. And uh, as soon as the government started capping pay at 2.5%, the private sector started capping pay at 2.5%, and 2.5% became the new normal. If governments get away with the wage freeze now, luckily the one in New South Wales has been defeated for the time being, but 0% uh, will become the new normal. And that's going to take us right into the depression uh, that Sally was talking about earlier. So I'm really glad that the, the unions mobilized and others mobilized in New South Wales. And hopefully that will be the first of many victories against that type of policy. Um, thank you so much for your time, Sally. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up before we go? Well, no, just stay safe, everyone. And um, we're going to be heading into a continually rough time. So um, you know, for all the union members um, online, you know, hello and um, thank you. But um, for everyone who's not a member, please join. We're going to need to um, be really strong and united because we're going to face, I think, a really tough um, last um, six months of this year. Uh, so, uh, you know, the way that we'll be able to influence history is by sticking together and just being one really strong, united voice. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure you're absolutely flat out at the moment. Thank you, Sally McManus and Jim Stanford. And thank you to all of you who have joined us online today. We really appreciate you coming to these webinars each week. This has been a special episode of Follow the Money, and we're aiming to bring you shorter but more frequent episodes during the pandemic. So stay tuned. You can check out the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series at our website tai.org.au forward slash webinars. The next event is on Friday the 12th of June at 11am when we'll be talking to independent member for Indi Helen Haynes along with former Supreme Court judges David Harper and Margaret White from the Australia Institute's National Integrity Committee. They'll be talking about the need for accountability and transparency. That's next Friday 12th of June at 11am. 
For the latest health information, you can check health.gov.au or listen to the ABC's excellent CoronaCast podcast, which comes out daily. We're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is Ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T and Sally McManus is at Sally McManus. Jim Stanford is at Jimbo Stanford. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy with help from Lucy Law. And our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum. And remember, stay 1.5 metres away, keep washing those hands and thanks for listening. Listener.